Okay, so um, what was on my heart is uh, a, and it's not gonna just be one teaching. It's I, I, couldn't, I couldn't just put it all in today. And I, I, was, I was trying, but it, sometimes the Lord doesn't let you do that. And so I wanna, I wanna focus on typology in the Bible, okay? So the title of this message, and uh, it's, it's, it's cool, I was praying about a title, and I was like, wow, that's, that's an awesome title. So the title is The Beginning of God's Awesome Typological Picture Book. It's awesome. So, so there, there, there's some meat here, okay? So the beginning of God's awesome typological picture book. All right, so um, we used to have a picture, we used to have these pencil drawing pictures and uh, I don't know what happened to them. Back in California, we didn't, or I think we probably gave them all away. Sometimes, sometimes the Lord tells me to give stuff away and then later years I'm, I'm like, where'd that go? Oh yeah, I gave it to brother so-and-so or what? <laughs> you see it on the wall of their house. I'm like, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> but I used to have these, these pictures and they were pencil drawings. They were real detailed, they were beautiful. And one of them was called the disciple. You remember, remember this one, Dara? So it was, it, it had the scripture from Psalm 1, blessed is the man who meditates on his word day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, okay? And so that's a blessing for each of you. If you meditate upon God's word day and night, you're gonna be like that tree. But the roots go into the water, your leaf won't wither. You'll bring forth the fruit in its season. Maybe not immediately, but in season, you're gonna bring forth fruit and whatever you do will prosper because you're tied in with the living water. It's coming up and there's fruit and, right? That's, that's true prosperity, right? Creflo Dollar won't teach you that. But, um, so this picture, it was a picture of a, of, of, a, of a, um, a, like a, look like a messianic believer, like a Jewish believer, like in the first century. And he's sitting on a rock and there's these, this beautiful river flowing and there's this tree above him, shading him. And he's, and he's, and he's reading the scroll. It's, uh, it's Psalm 1. And he's, he's looking at it, he's meditating on the word, right? But if you look at the picture, and I would do this, because you, once you see, once you, the Lord shows you something, then you see it. You can't unsee it. Once God gives you a revelation of something, then you see it, right? And as long as you stay in the Lord, right, and you don't depart from the faith, you're going to continue seeing that. Like you come, to, the Lord shows you something in the word, it's like, whoa, right? And you come back to that, you're like, wow, yeah, I see that now. You can't unsee it. The, the danger is, the Bible also warns that if you depart from the faith, then you can even forget that you were cleansed from your past sins. So you can't forget. That's scary. Okay, so let's not do that. But, so this picture, if you looked at it, there was something that would pop out. Like, whoa, and you'd see it, and then you could never not see it. And what it was is, in the, in the branches, in the tree branches, it was like, the, it, it, was a, it was a silhouette, okay? And it was, it, was, it was like a silhouette of Jesus. He had a crown of thorns on his head, and it was a silhouette of Jesus, really tastefully done, okay? And, and, and looked, you know, like a real, like what he might look like, okay? You know, a lot of blonde hair, blue eyes flowing down, you know, and all that stuff, but just looked, it looked like what he might possibly look like. And, his, and, and he's looking down, like in approval upon this man, that's read, meditating on the word, and, and, and you see that in the tree branches. But if you look at it first, you can't see it. You can't see it. You have to like look and, and then, what, whoa, it just comes out. You see it there. And then also in the tree on the side, there, you, if you, you, you spend time meditating, sometimes you don't see anything until you meditate, okay? You can just read, you can just read, and sometimes stuff just stays on the surface. But meditate is going a little bit deeper, right? Going deeper. Sometimes just stay stuff, if you just, you just read the words, just, you know, I talk to Faith, you know, I encourage her to take some time. And you know, not, not like, like the plunger, putting the food in the plunger and then just like putting it down, you know what I mean? Like that, you don't eat food that way. I wouldn't, you'd never, you'd never use a plunger, but I just, I thought a clean one, a brand new one. A brand, a brand new one, brand new one. Yeah, brand new one, all right? You put your, put your cereal in, the, in there and you just shove it down into your stomach. Do you guys ever do that? No. You would never do that, right? No. So we shouldn't do that with the word, right? Amen, bro. Amen. But sometimes we don't see it. We, something doesn't come out because we don't spend the time. We don't meditate upon the word, right? 
we just just like take it down right into our stomach. We don't we don't go through the process. So, and also in the tree it had had a dove. There's a dove there, but you wouldn't see it unless you really meditate. Unless unless also we need help, right? We can't understand the things of God without the Spirit of God. We need help, right? Don't we need help to understand the things of God to see deeper things? You know, that's why we pray. Uh, I pray all the time. I say. Uh, you know, open my eyes to behold wonderful things that I know not. Okay, that's what the scripture does. It tells us, it admonishes us to pray. So we can do that. Just ask the Lord, show me things I don't know. And he'll show us. But that's, that's a picture, okay, that pops out. And, you know, I, I used to think about that related to God's word. And uh, in, in the word of God, there's, there's tons of specific prophecies that are just detailed specific prophecies okay um and that's different than like the artistic paintings of of pictures that god has all through the word there's specific prophecies like isaiah 53 okay isaiah 53 is very detailed specific about jesus and what he's going to do as the messiah very detailed very specific and then there's other things in the word that uh, that aren't, aren't really like that, that maybe you wouldn't see unless you, you're reading the New Testament, okay? And unless it was given to you, um, like that rock. Okay, there was a rock in the wilderness when the children of Israel came out of the wilderness. And remember, they were thirsty. And God told them, strike the rock. Told Moses, strike the rock. And water would come out of the rock. Okay? So, I mean, that, that, was, that was some real event that happened. But then, and then... Later, God told him, speak to the rock. Because if they're thirsty again, don't strike the rock again. Speak to the rock, and water will come out. But Moses got upset with them, and he struck the rock again. That was all a picture, just like I'm showing you about that pencil picture where the face of Jesus came out in the dove. That was all a picture of something. Okay. So in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul, he's laying out the history of the children of Israel, how they were rebelling in the wilderness, and he talks about that rock. He says that rock was Christ. That rock in the wilderness where it was struck and water came out, Jesus, so it's a picture, you see what I'm saying? That's a, that's a typological picture. It's a type of something else, greater. And so that was a picture of Christ being struck on the cross, right? And even, remember, he got pierced in the side, what came out? Blood and water came out, but, more, but even greater than that, the spirit came out later. Because he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, then the spirit came. 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit is symbolized as water in the Scripture. Living water. Amen? So water flowed. So, but then when Moses struck again, that was kind of messing up the picture. Because the Scripture says he's only going to die once, right? He's once offered for sins. The just for the unjust. Not going to be struck again. So when he was struck, when Moses struck the rock, that was a picture. When he got angry, that's why God told him to speak to the rock. Because now, he's not going to get struck again. All we have to do is come to him and speak, right? Right? We have to call upon the name of the Lord. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We speak now, right? We don't, he's, not going to be, he's not going to die again. So that's an example of typological picture in the Bible. And so the Lord has filled his whole word, the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, he has filled it with pictures. Okay, and some you can see, um, you can see them uh, revealed in the New Testament. There's a lot in the New Testament, like I just shared. The Apostle Paul, he 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 spoke about that rock. Some are revealed in the New Testament. These pictures from the Old Testament, and the, the apostles speak about them by the Holy Spirit. And then others, they're they're not revealed that way, but they're still in the Scripture. Maybe they're not spoken of in the New Testament, but they're still there. Okay, and so the whole Bible is full of full of these pictures and um, some of them we would never see unless the Holy Spirit had moved the writers of the New Testament to write about. We would never even know that they were actually paintings that the Lord was drawing in the Old Testament. So it's pretty awesome. Um, but the majority of the, the typological pictures, the majority of them, not all of them, they have to do with Jesus. Okay? Because from beginning to end, Okay, he's that scarlet, scarlet cord. Okay, that's another one. Ray, you know, putting out the scarlet cord out her window. All right, but 
all through, it's all about Jesus. So the majority of typological pictures are about Jesus. And I'm going to read Hebrews. These, these are some scriptures that have to do with that. Um, from the New Testament, okay? Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 5 through 7. It says, Therefore, when he came into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, this is the Messiah. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. So, the volume of the whole scriptures, it is written of who? Who's that? That's Jesus, right? In the volume of the book, it is written of me. To do your will, O God. That's the Father. Saying to the Father, okay? So, the volume of the book, it's written of him. You know, sometimes you've read through, you read through the Old Testament. Have you, have you seen Jesus every single chapter? And every, well, the volume of the book is written about him. There's, there's some deep things, actually, in the Old Testament Okay, deep pictures and paintings and, and allusions and different things that, that reveal Christ, reveal Messiah in some awesome ways, okay? I know a lot of you know, you, you know a lot of them. Um, I, I think we'll, we're going to touch on one today, just begin about one of them today that I think maybe, possibly, maybe you haven't thought about. And it just kind of, you know, really blessed me, uh, myself, because I hadn't really meditated on that until I started seeking the Lord in, on this message. Um, and then Luke 24, the Lord speaks about this. Luke 24, 25 to 27 says, Then he said to them, so he's walking with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, right? They don't know it's him. He's walking with them. So he's kind of hid himself from them. And he's kind of inquiring, you know, they're, 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 they're sad. You know, he's like, so what happened? Why are you sad? You know, well, you haven't heard <laughs> what happened to Jesus of Nazareth? You know, we thought he was... He was a mighty prophet, you know, Messiah, you know, but not. It's been three days, he's dead, you know, he died, and like, oh, what's going on? So he's walking with them. So awesome. I would love to have been there. And he says, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And here's the key. And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures. So you got Moses, you got the prophets, you got all the scriptures, you got the Psalms, all the historical books. He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wow. That must have been some kind of revelation. In all the scriptures, Psalms, prophets, Moses, everything. The whole Tanakh, okay? Okay. So he, he opened it up and showed them things concerning himself. So the Lord must have shown them some, some radical pictures of himself. He must have shown them some radical pictures. Um, remember Jesus wrote, uh, Jesus spoke in John 5.46. says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For Moses wrote about me. So Moses wrote about Jesus, okay? And you can see, like, well, how did, he, how did he write about him? Like, I don't see some really, really specific things like Isaiah 53. That's very specific. You, you can show Isaiah 53 to a Jew, um, and if they don't know what you're talking about, okay, you could read it to them, and they'll think you're reading part of the New Testament. Oh, that's Jesus. We don't believe in Jesus. Well, it's from Yeshayahu. It's from your prophet Isaiah. Can I show you? No, it's not. And there's, there's videos out there. You know, we have a brother in Israel that actually has made a video, Isaiah 53, where he's a Jewish believer, and he goes out and he shares about Isaiah 53 with, with Jews, and they, they think it's like New Testament. They think, it's some, they think it's just some Christian writings, but it's actually in the Old Testament. So, um, but Moses wrote about Jesus. So it's more than just detailed, specific prophecies. It's picture form, okay? typological pictures that are in the Old Testament about Jesus. So it's just, it's just an awesome thing to, to think about how God does that. So I wanted to go through the New Testament. There's, there's seven words. And so seven is an important number in the Bible. 
okay? Seven is very important. Seven is a number of completion in the scriptures, okay? I don't even think it's a coincidence, but there's seven words in the New Testament that have to do with uh, typology, that are related to typology, okay? And uh, the New Testament is where, you know, we, we kind of, we don't just try to make up stuff. We're not, we're not trying to just make up pictures, okay? We don't want to do that. We want to read things into the Bible and, and just make up things. We have the New Testament, and there's so many pictures that the New Testament shows us that maybe you, you wouldn't know if you didn't have the New Testament, <laughs> okay? But there's, there's seven words in the New Testament related to typology, and so I just want to go through those real quick, okay? Um, and these kind of define it. All right, define the different various typological pictures that you find in the Bible. So number one is tupas. Okay, that's the word. It's tupas. And what it means is type. Um, it means an imprint. It means a scar. Okay, so a mark of a blow, like, like, a, like a tool and die, like a stamp. Okay, you have the tool and then you have what's stamped, right? Then you have the imprint, right? So they used to do that too, right? They would have a signet ring and they would make a stamp on the letters and they would put, you know, that's, that's what the Romans would do. So that's what tupas is like. Um, it's a figure, a copy, an image, a pattern, a model. Pre, it's prefiguring something or somebody, okay? A tupas. And John 20, 25 is a verse where this word is used, tupas, John 20, 25. And it says, the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands, who's this? This is Thomas, right? Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Okay? Now, we don't want to be like that in our life. We don't want to be like that with the Lord. And say, unless you do this, unless you show me this, unless you say this, unless you meet my standards, I won't believe in you. We don't want to have that attitude, right? We don't want to do that with God. But the word here, uh, the print, his, his hands in the print of the nails, put my finger on the print of the nails, that is the word tupas. Okay, it's an imprint, it's a scar. And, and Jesus even showed the scars, right? You know, he showed the scars. And even now, when in, in the in book of Revelation, he bears the he bears the scars. So forever we will see the tupas, right? The imprint, the scars of love upon the Savior for you. Forever. That'll keep us always humble, right? Amen. So just as the scar is an imprint of a, of a certain event, just like, you know, the crucifixion the, and, the, and the beating that he went through, he bears the scars, okay? It's an imprint of a certain event. So God makes the type as an imprint of the anti-type, all right? So the, so the, the, the scar is, is a type of the anti-type. That's, that's what that is. And so number two, the, the second word is going along with that is called anti-tupon. Anti-tupon. And it is the anti-type. Okay? It's the anti-type. And so the type, the type is the picture that speaks to what God is going to do. That's the type. Or what's going to happen in the future. And the anti-type is the fulfillment of the picture. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? So, so it's like the tool and dial, like I said, you, or the signet. Okay, you have the imprint part, the, the, the pressed part. Okay, that's, that's the type. The anti-type would be the actual ring. See what I'm saying? So that's type and anti-type. So anti-tupon, that's what that is. It's the anti-type or the fulfillment of the picture. Okay, the fulfillment of the picture. And Peter uses the word anti-tupon in 1 Peter chapter 3 um, when he was speaking of a fulfilled typology of Noah's Ark, okay? First Peter chapter three, uh, if you wanna go there, you can. First Peter chapter three, verses 20 and 21. Who formerly were disobedient, 
when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype. So he uses the word antitupon. There's also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. But here's a key. But not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right? So baptism, well, in, first before that, notice something here. It says that the ark, it went through the water. All right? The ark didn't just stay on top of the water. It went through the water. Remember, that's, that, this is a type of something. The ark is actually a type or a picture of something, okay? So the ark didn't just rest on top of the water and you can see pictures where the ark's like on top of the water. No, no, this, this was like, you know, yeah, it was all over and it was, it was not gonna capsize. God built this thing. <laughs> he told him that, what to do. But it went through the water too. Okay, I'm not saying it was a submarine the whole, whole ways, but most of that thing was under the water. And it, this was not like my pond out here, the storm, okay? You know, this was serious, right? Cataclysmic event. So it went through the water. So the type, the type here in uh, verse, verse 20 and 21, the type is the salvation that came to the eight souls that were in the ark who went through the water and came back up again, okay? Because there were eight souls in the ark, right? They went through the water, and then they came back up. Remember, on the mountains of Ararat, and it rested. This is a type. This is a picture of something else, okay? So it's, it's really awesome. And the, the antitype, or the fulfillment of that, okay, is our baptism. That's the fulfillment of that type of the ark, of those eight souls going through the water and coming up. Our baptism is the anti-tupon, the antitype, the fulfillment. You see what I'm saying? You see, the, you see this awesome picture? Okay, this awesome. And so this, we wouldn't really know some of this unless the Holy Spirit, remember, it's, it's, these are holy men moved by the Holy Spirit to write these things down. Because they remember that. This is the Holy Spirit that's giving this word, right? So we wouldn't know some of these things unless the Holy Spirit had Peter write this. We, we wouldn't know this, right? So some of these pictures, you wouldn't know them unless God had revealed them. So he reveals these, these pictures, okay? And uh, so that's pretty awesome. Um, it's a picture, so this is a, this is a picture of our salvation, how we've entered into the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? We've entered into that, all right? And it's important to understand that, you know, getting dipped in the water doesn't save anybody, okay? That doesn't save anybody. You, can, you, you get dipped in the water and come up just the same, all right? That doesn't save anybody. As, as, as the scripture says here, it's not getting dipped in the water, but it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. And what that means is that's our faith. The answer of a good conscience towards God is our faith in the living God, okay? Because we're saved by grace through what? Faith. Amen? And what pleases God? Our faith, right? In Him. Okay, it is a response. It's, it's not saying, you know, it's all on us. It's a response to God, right? He's done the initiating. I'm responding in faith. And so, it's not getting dunked in water that does anything. That's, that's not what saves you. It's, it's, our baptism is an expression of our faith. It's an expression of our faith. Amen? And there had to be some faith to get on the ark. You think? There had to be some faith to get on the ark? I mean, they, haven't, they hadn't seen anything like that happen before. Well, I mean, why do you think a lot of people didn't get on? Why do you think the scripture admonishes us to have faith in God? Because you could not have faith in God. You know? You, you could not get on the ark. You don't trust God. Right? So... Those eight, they had to exercise faith because the just shall live by faith all through Scripture. Those who are right with God are right with God by faith from beginning to end. That's it. And so that's what happened there. And, um, so, and, and just a side note, uh, as far as we're talking about pictures here. So we see that, that type of the eight souls going through the water coming back up, right? Anti-Tupon, anti our baptism. 
okay? But also the arc itself, this, just the, the arc itself is a type itself of Jesus Christ himself. He's the fulfillment of that actual arc. And just, th just think about it, there's only, there, how many doors are on the ark? How many ways in the ark? Jesus said, I am the what? The way. I am also the door. So the ark itself, okay, yeah, the eight souls going through the water coming up, picture of our baptism. The ark itself is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't get in, if you didn't get in that ark, are you saved? No. Same thing today. That ark itself is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the door is open. Remember, who shut the door? God shut the door. It's like Noah was like, ah, get the door shut. Come on, come on, come on. No, it's like, boom. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a picture of the end. I mean, there's an end to all of our lives. The door is going to be shut. And then there's no more getting in. You know what I mean? So it's very serious. That's a picture of Christ. I mean, it's not, we don't have eternity to make up our minds here. We don't have eternity, right? There's going to be eternity to pay if you don't make up your mind now. So you need to get in. But that, and, and Noah was a preacher of righteousness, calling people to, to get in. What, what, Noah's a picture of us. We're preachers of righteousness now, right? And we're trying to get people in the ark. Do you see that picture too? I mean, so this, typology is my favorite subject in the Bible. It's just, it's just my favorite subject in the Bible. I love it. And um, so I'm excited about it. The next, the next word, uh, the third word, is hupotuposis. Hupotuposis. Y'all want to say that? Hupotuposis. All right, all right. Only the, those who had faith took a step, stab at that. Okay, so what, it, what that is, it's an outline or a sketch or a pattern of something. Okay, so an outline or a sketch or a pattern of something. And you know, I used to, I used to work in a shop and I used to make things out of metal and they, I'd have to have a blueprint or a sketch or a pattern. It wasn't the actual thing yet, right? If I just, they gave, they gave me the drawings and I just said, I just waited an hour and then I came back and I gave my boss the drawings, it's not gonna work, right? I mean, that's, that's, not, the, that's not the fulfillment. I wanna see the fulfillment of this drawing right here. Right? You know? And so that's, that's, the, that's what this word is. It's an outline or sketch or pattern of something. And Paul talked about his life. The Apostle Paul, his life was a hupotuposis. The Apostle Paul. Okay? He talked about himself being the chief of sinners. All right? And how God saved him as a hupotuposis, as a pattern. He saved him as a pattern for those that would come after him, all right? And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that, right? I mean, he was a radical enemy of God. He's a radical enemy of God. And, but it's, it's, it's really beautiful that the Lord did that for a reason. So 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16 says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Of whom I am chief, he says. Of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a hupotuposis, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So God made him a hupotuposis, a pattern, right? of what he wants to do in anybody. So like, he's like, God made me a pattern because it's like the pattern of patterns. Like I was the worst, you know? And what, what this pattern is saying is that he'll save any of all of you. He'll save any of you. If, he, if he'll save me, he'll save you. So God made him that pattern. So you look like, if you think, if you think like I've, I'm so wicked, I've done such things, and God says, poopoo to poses. Look at Saul of Tarsus. Oh, okay. Murdered Christians, right? I mean, persecuted Jesus and, you know, he blasphemed the name of the Lord. And, you know, so God made him that. So that's another word that's used for different typological uh, scenarios, okay? The next word, number four, 
is hupodegma, hupodegma. And hupodegma means a figure, a copy, an example, or a model. So these are all different words that are used for this, what we're talking about. And this word is used in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. And it's used when it was describing the, uh, what God did to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? So in 2 Peter 2, 6, it says this. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them a hupodegma, making them an example. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly. So here's another one, hupodegma. So God has made Sodom and Gomorrah, a hupodegma, an example to anyone in the world who would live ungodly. Here's what's gonna happen to you. This is, what's gonna, this is, how, this is how I deal with wickedness. Okay? So there's, there's the pattern. If you, if you wanna know, you're living ungodly, you're choosing to live ungodly, here's a pattern for you. Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? But it's gonna be a lot worse than the lake of fire. But that's a pattern, and God made that a hupodegma. That's a word that's, that's used for that, um, of what God does and what he's going to do to the wicked. And remember, Jesus said, in the last days, it will be like the days of what? Noah. Noah? It'll be like, the, referring to Sodom and Gomorrah, it'll be like the days of Lot. So he's saying, hey, hupodegma, there's an example. Don't go that way. Don't go that way. So the next word is... Skia, okay, the next Greek word used for this subject, skia, and it means a shadow um, or shade. So like if, if somebody's, there could be somebody shading you, right? They're standing there and they're, they're, they're shadow and they're providing shade and their shadow's hitting you or the shadow of the tree is providing shade, right? But the shadow and the shade is not the tree. You see what I'm saying? So that's the skia. Is the, is the shadow or the shade that's being provided, of, and it points to something else. It's not the reality of that. That tree is the fulfillment of it, okay? And so in most, most of the translations uh, that we have, they translate this word skia as shadow, okay? They translate it that. Uh, probably best verse for that is Colossians chapter two, verse 16 and 17. And it says, so let none of you let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow, a skia, okay? A shadow of things to come. So they speak of some, something else, right? Now this is, but the substance is Christ, right? So you have the shadows, these shadows, okay? They actually speak of Christ. He's the substance. So he's our great uh, an, uh, anti-tupon, right? The fulfillment, yeah. amen, of the shadows. So these are all pretty awesome words, amen? Uh, the next word, number six, is uh, parabole. And we get our word parable, that's what you probably think of, parabole. Uh, we think of parable, how the Lord taught parables. And a parabole is like a, compar a comparison. It would be used as a comparison of something, a symbol, a proverb, uh, a teaching aid that's cast alongside of the truth being taught. So a teaching aid that comes alongside of the truth that's being taught to help you understand it, okay? And so a parabole. And this is pretty radical right here, how this is used, okay? Radical picture, one of my favorites, it's in, from Genesis 22. So Abraham taking his son Isaac, right? Isaac is a picture of Jesus, Abraham a picture of the father, okay? Carrying the wood, Isaac's carrying the wood on his back. Remember Jesus carried the cross up to Mount Moriah. That's the same place that Abraham told Isaac, or told, God told Abraham to take Isaac, same Mount Moriah, take him up there, right? And, uh, you know, Abraham tells his servants, we won't go into that whole thing, but he, he told his servants, you know, me and the lad will come back. So, but in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 to 19, in the New Testament, it opens up this, 
and uses this word parabole. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up. So we, we have this, we, we have Abraham saying to his servants, okay, I remember it was also three days journey, three days journey to Mount Moriah, Jesus rose on the third day. So remember when God told Abraham, no, you know, this is a test to see if you love me, right? They came back on the third day. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. So that's a picture, okay, of the resurrection right there. But um, it says that he concluded that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which also he received him in a figurative sense. That's parabole. You see? So he was a parabole, okay, with the actual resurrection. Isaac coming back, okay? They took the journey three days, came back. It was a parabole of Jesus' resurrection on the third day, okay? And of course, the very, it's so awesome, Genesis 22. The very first time the word love is used in the Bible, Genesis 22, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? And we all know John 3, 16, right? The very first time the word love is used in the Bible is Genesis 22, when Abraham takes Isaac up on Mount Moriah, the very place that Jesus died. So is God into pictures? I mean, I'm just, I'm, I just love it. He's so awesome, right? He didn't have to put all these, all these pictures in that and, and do all these. I mean, it's, he's, it's like he's put these in here so we can find them and be, be amazed at him, right? Just be amazed at who God is. So Isaac's a picture of the resurrection right here. And obviously, I mean, Abraham, it said, Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You know, and he saw it and he was glad. So there's a beautiful thing happening there. There's a lot more than that, but maybe sometime we'll go into that. Uh, number seven is, the word is Samion. Samion. And it's a distinctive sign or mark or feature which points to something else. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he used this word of himself, Samion, when he was rebuking the rebellious Jews. He used this, this word, Samion, okay, which had to do with typology. So in Matthew chapter 12, 39, he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a Samion, seeks after a sign, okay? But what's he say? And no Samion will be given to it except the Samion, the sign of the prophet Jonah. So here we have Jesus revealing that there's something radical happening with Jonah, right? And Jonah was a type of something that was going to happen with Jesus, right? And so Jonah's an awesome picture of Jesus, of course. We know that uh, just as Jesus was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Jonah Three days, three nights in the belly of the fish. And so Jesus actually points this typology, he points it out, right? Because they're seeking a sign. They're wanting to see something like that. And he said, okay, I'm not gonna get, there's not going to be anything, any sign except the one that's been given in Jonah. I don't think they probably knew anything about that. See, Jesus revealing these things that they didn't know anything about Jonah. They weren't like look, looking and see these things about Jonah being a, a, a type of what the Messiah is going to go through. You know, they're not, they're not seeing that, but he points it out. And so hopefully some of them went back and they're like, whoa. You know, especially after he died and he rose from the dead, right? They might have saw that. Um, but so he was a, he was a picture. Um, but but Jonah is even more of a picture than just the three days and three nights in, in, the, in the fish, okay? He's even more of a radical picture. Uh, he's also a picture of the first Adam. Jesus is called the last Adam in the Bible. Because Adam is actually a type of Christ, like in reverse, okay? In reverse, like what Adam did wrong, Jesus did right, okay? Just as when Jesus was tempted, Adam was tempted, Jesus, and he fell. Jesus was tempted, he didn't fall, okay? So it's a fulfillment like in reverse, all right? But Jonah is a picture of, in rebellion, he's like a picture of the, last, of the first Adam, okay? And he's a picture of the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, when, remember when he's on the ship, remember the storm? God sent the storm, right? And what did Jonah, what did Jonah do? He laid down his life. 
throw me over. Throw me over, and then you'll be saved. Okay? So, so we, know, we know that when he's in the fish, right? We know that's a picture, right? Three days, three nights, right? And we know it's a picture, but before that, okay, he, he's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ who offered himself for others to be saved, right? He laid down his life, so they threw Jonah in. That's a picture of when the Lord offered, him, offered himself. And then when he's in, the, he's in the fish, okay, and then what happens? Get spit out in, in the shores of Nineveh, right? <laughs> God brings them and delivers them. That's a picture of the resurrection, okay? So you have him offering himself, going, being buried, right, in the fish, coming up. That's resurrection. So you have death, burial, and resurrection. A lot of times we only think of the being in the fish for three days and three nights, but, but not the other two sides of it. So Jonah's a radical picture uh, of that. And um, so these are, these are some specific words that are used to define like various types, various kinds of typological pictures in, in the Bible. Um, not every typology uses these exact words that, that I'm sharing. They don't all use these words. But this just describes the various kinds of typologies that we find in the Bible. Does that make sense? Uh, every typology doesn't use these words, but it's just, it's just explaining the, the variety of typologies that there are. And I just wanted to show you in the New Testament um, that there are these kinds of typologies in the Bible. So I just wanted to show you, because the Bible is our authority. Okay, I don't want to just go hunting down pictures, but I want to show you, you know, in the New Testament, it uses these words to describe there's are, there are these varieties of kinds of pictures. Okay, and so that's important to kind of have the Bible as our authority. Our authority. Um, but typology, what, what it does for me, uh, seeing these beautiful pictures of, of, uh, of the things of the Lord, um, it just causes me to, to love God's word even more. You know what I mean? I, I really think that's why God has done that. You know, just I, I just I just love God's word. It's just it's a treasure chest. It's so full of riches and beauty and things to discover of Him, and it just makes me just type more than anything. When I start understanding these things, it's kind of like you know we start on the milk, but we get to get to the meat. Amen. Milk and meat. The, the typology in the Bible is a little more meaty. It's a little, it's kind of more meaty. Okay. And, uh, you know, the writer of Hebrews says, hey, you know, there's a time to get off the bottle and to get into some, some meatier things of the word. Amen? And, but, the, but the bottle's good, too. Right? As a newborn babe desires the pure milk of its mother, he tells us to desire the pure milk of the word of God. Okay? So, that's good. God, God feeds us a balanced diet. Amen? You know, I, I sometimes need a little milk, too. Um, and it's good just to remember those things. But that's, that's what I love about it. And, um, you know, we all, we all like pictures, I think. You know, I think Faith just took like 500 pictures yesterday when we were visiting uh, Dad. I looked on my phone. I couldn't, I couldn't believe how many were on there. I gave her the phone to take pictures, and I'm like, <laughs> she's like, <laughs> like, like a machine gun, like pictures. Like, you know how you could press it and it goes, it just takes like 500 pictures? That's what it looked like. It's like, but but picture people. Love, we all love pictures, right? Um, and so that's that's what God has put in, and uh, we like pictures that tell a story, though, right? I, I remember when I was a when I was a boy, I would like those, you know, those thin picture books, my my uh, that you would get. They're like, um, what were the, what were those called, bro? Like the golden. Um, they had a name for them. Like. <laughs> Into that one. Well, I mean, I think y'all like picture picture books. Yeah, do you remember those? I used to hear from you. Anyway, mine, my favorite was Big Joe's tractor trailer truck. Big Joe's tractor trailer truck, and it, it was a it was called Big Joe's. I think it was called Big Joe's trailer truck. But they're like they're like thin books. They're like you know like about that big, and they they're all pictures, and they just have you know they they tell a little story and stuff. Yeah, good. Yeah. Boom! Yeah, I had those when I was a kid. Bro, he knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. With the little foil. Golden pit. Yeah, yeah, it was picture books, right? Like a gold binder around the yeah. yeah, but each page had each page had a big picture, and they would have a little story and stuff. Yeah, yeah. that old soul. We had. <laughs> I got old ears. <laughs> so you know, we all like that. And when little children, they love 
listening to stories, right? And reading picture books. I loved it when I was a child. And as children of God, right? God has put all these pictures in his word, right? You know? And I mean, we should be excited, like, like children, you know, when, when, like when I was little and I'd be excited to read that, that book. I had another book that was, it was like um, Grover's Great Adventure through the museum of, of everything that could ever be. Oh, you remember that one? <laughs> and he'd go through, it was a museum, and he'd go through and, and he was with the fish, and then he went to the next one, and he saw astronaut, you know, spaceships, and, and each room had a different thing, and then he got to the end, and, but I used, I used to love these picture books. And so, but now, this is the picture book of picture book. Amen? And so typology, that's, that's one to get you excited about this. About this, about God's word. Be excited about God's word. And uh, so as a father, uh, you know, as a father, uh, he, he kind of wants to take us up on, on his lap, you know, and show us his picture book. You know what I mean? If we spend time with him in his word, show us these things, right? He loves to do that and uh, show us these incredible typologies. So now that we kind of covered that, um, I want to go back to go back to our title of, of this teaching. And it's going to be maybe a couple more. But um, the title is The Beginning of God's Awesome Typological Picture Book. That's the title of this, of this message. Um, so the question is, where did God begin painting these awesome pictures? Where did God begin? <laughs> yeah, Bereshit, right? Bereshit, the beginning. So he began painting these pictures in the very beginning. That's where he began. And that's what we would expect, right? You know? And uh, so I, I got a question to ask um, related to this, because what we're going to go into. Um, what's more important in the Bible? Okay, just think about this question. This is a thought I'm thinking about. Uh, the plan of creation, okay? Or the plan of redemption? Now, I, I know you can't have redemption without creation, but that's not, that's not, what, I'm trying to, that's not what I'm trying to ask. Which, which plan is more important? The plan of creation or the plan of redemption? Okay. Huh? Redemption. redemption. Obviously. Redemption. So, because redemption cost him his blood. Amen? He didn't, he didn't shed blood in creating the universe. Although, another type, Adam, in the book of Genesis, I'm getting ahead of myself, but Adam is a type of Christ, and he shed blood. Okay? And from his side, he made the woman, which is symbolic of the church. Just as Jesus shed blood on the cross, from his side came blood and water. So when, when Adam, when that happened, when God put him in a sleep, and he did shed blood, and that was a type of the anti-tupon, an anti-type, which is Christ, who shed blood for us on the cross. Amen? So, it's, I mean, it's just it's awesome. There's, it's, it's just there's treasures. But, um, so, redemption is infinitely more important. Um, it cost him infinitely more to redeem humanity than to create humanity. Amen? It cost him infinitely more. And, and also, this creation isn't going to last, is it? God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth, right? So in creation, his plan is awesome, but the redemption plan is going to last. And then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, right? So the redemption of humanity, humanity is more important. So from the beginning, all the way from the beginning, with that in mind, what we're going to kind of see a little bit, just a little bit of, uh, is how God foreshadowed the plan of redemption in creation, okay? He foreshadowed that. From the very beginning, he foreshadowed it. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1. So what we'll focus in on is verse 1, 1 through 3, or chapter 1, 1 through 3. Okay, the first three verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. 
and there was light. So, it's a whole lot here, but uh, why, why did God create like this? Why, why did God create, begin to create like this, in this way? And where, where the, the earth is formless and void, and, and in the beginning there's darkness, and the earth is formless, void. So, I mean, just if you think about it, God could have created any way he wanted. Amen? He didn't have to create with the earth formless and void and darkness on it. Okay? He didn't have to create that way. He could have, from the beginning, boom, have it all beautiful, pristine, with life and fullness and light. And from the beginning, couldn't he do that? Just, okay? But he didn't do that. And I believe, and I believe the, the not just because I believe it, but I believe the Bible teaches this, that the reason that he didn't create it like that from the beginning, but he started creation this way, is because in his creation, um, he was going to show a powerful, uh, artistic, prophetic picture in how he created. Okay? Prophetic, meaning it's speaking of something in the future. Okay? And a picture. And like a, a type of something greater. Amen? And so it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, he could have created anyway, but he didn't. So that's how he did it. And so the, the heavens and the earth here, he created the heavens and the earth. Um, and they're in some kind of, some kind of state, okay, where they're, they're not shaped yet. So the heavens and the earth, is, it's in some kind of a state where it's not shaped or formed yet. All right? And he did that. And we're not going to go into gap theory and all that kind of stuff, you know, where they say, you know, uh, there was an ancient civilization and death before Adam and all that kind of stuff. And, and there was evil entities that are at war with God and, 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 and they're fighting and, and God won and this is the result of that. And there's, that, that's actually, that's just bogus, okay? The Bible doesn't support any of that. Uh, death is the result of sin. There was no sin or death before Adam, okay? It's, that's what the Bible teaches. So this, that, this what, what is happening here isn't a result of some fight that God had with entities, spiritual entities, an ancient civilization that lived before Adam. That's just made up, okay, stuff that the Bible doesn't support. Um, but what, what's happening is the, the heavens and the earth, they're in some kind of state, they're not formed yet, and, and I think of it like this. I think of it like, you know, like a potter, and a potter has a wheel, Okay, and what does he start with? He's got like, boom, just a, just a piece of, just a, a lump of, of dead clay. Okay, dead, cold, lifeless clay, right? It's just there, you know? Nothing beauty, no, no beauty in that or anything like that, okay? So that's, that's what we're seeing here. That's what we're seeing kind of set up and it hasn't been formed or shaped yet, all right? We created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So there's this lump of clay in the potter's wheel, and the, and the potter's, he's about to start shaping it, okay? Is God our potter? Is he the potter? In the Bible, he teaches that, right? So he's about to start shaping it. Um, and the, the Lord's showing us, I believe he's showing us a, a radical picture of the plan of redemption and uh, this, in this artistic way. So I think what I'm going to do is jump to how the Bible actually teaches us, okay? Um, the Apostle Paul. So in the New Testament, talk, we showed how the, in the New Testament there's things that were revealed that you wouldn't have known otherwise, right? So the Apostle Paul, he actually points back to this. He actually points back to this as a picture of our salvation experience, okay? Each one of us who has salvation here, what you're seeing here in Genesis 1, 1 through 3 is a picture of our salvation experience. Okay? And it's, it's, it's not me making it up. It's just this what the Lord teaches. Um, the Word of God teaches it. So we need to remember uh, that what we're going to read here, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And, and let's remember that what we're going to read here was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. The, the Spirit of God, right, we read in Genesis 1, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the, the, the face of the waters, right? Right? 
So the Spirit of God, the same Spirit of God there in Genesis 1 is the one who's inspiring the Apostle Paul to write this. So just don't separate, like when you think of the Apostle Paul, you got to think of the Holy Spirit is moving him to write this. All right? The same Spirit who's there on day one of creation. All right? So if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Here we have the Lord revealing this, this picture here. So it says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. That's Genesis 1. That's Genesis 1, verse 3, right there. It is God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Remember, let there be light, and there was light, right? It's God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, Genesis 1, 3, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay? So here you have the Holy Spirit revealing that in Genesis 1, 3, 1, 1 through 3, you have a picture going on here. It's a picture of something greater than the creation. It's a picture of the redemption. It's our experience right here. Okay? And so this is just radical. Right from the beginning, you see God, you know, it even says, you know, did God know us before the foundation? Right? Did he know us before the foundation? Did he, did, it says he was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Right? So it's like God had a pre-production meeting before he even started creating. He knows all things. The plan of redemption was already in play. You know? And then he creates this way to show a picture of redemption. So it's just radical when you think of the mind of God and how awesome he is. Amen? So here you have Paul. So you have the authority of the word of God pointing back to Genesis 1, 1 through 3 as a picture of our salvation experience, redemption, okay? Which is radical. Um, and so he draws a line right back to Genesis by the Spirit of God. He draws a line right back there and uh, of what God's done in our hearts. So going back to Genesis 1, let's continue looking at uh, verse 2, okay? Verse 2 says, The earth was without form, and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So in the Hebrew, we get to, this is a kind of a fun Hebrew phrase, okay? We get to kind of learn this one together. This one is really important because it has to do with you. Those of you who have no, no, no salvation, you know, you're, you're part of the plan of redemption, you've entered into it, okay? So the word uh, where it says, without form and void, okay? It's the Hebrew phrase, and you want to write this down. Tohu wa bohu. Okay? Tohu wa bohu. Tohu wa bohu. Without form and void. It's a, it's a very important phrase to learn. So we're going to say it on three. Okay, I'll say it one more time. Tohu wa bohu. Tohu without form. Wa and bohu. Okay? So one, two, three. Tohu wa bohu. Pam, probably sounds like something you speak in Africa, huh? <laughs> okay, so tohu wa bohu. So before we, before we came to Christ, right? Before we came to Christ, we were tohu. We were toe up. <laughs> if you think about it, <laughs> that's what we were, right? That's another way, that's, maybe that's another picture. But we were, we were tohu, okay? Um, we were formless, right? Just think about it. Think about yourself. Before Christ, you were without form. You had no direction. Right? I mean, you think of something formed, it's got some, it's got some direction, right? You were, no, you were without form. You were tohu. And so was I. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, speaks to this. It says, And you... He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That describes tohu, right? So when it speaks of the course of this world, okay? So we were without form. We were without direction, right? When, and that's what this Ephesians 2 is talking about. We were on the course of this world. And think back to your life. You, were, you had no direction. 
right? The enemy was directing you. And no purpose. Without form. And it's interesting, the, the Greek word for the course right here, the course of this world, it, it had to do with a, a weather vane. Okay, so that's what this word says, when you were on the course of this world. So a weather vane is what you see like on a barn. And, and it just, you've seen that on the top of a barn? And the wind blows and it goes, right? Right? That's what we were. Think about your life before Christ. You were a weather vane. You were on the course. That's what that word means, weather vane. That's what we were. And the enemy was just like, was like just smacking you around and just t telling you what to do and you were captive and you were without form. And that, so that really describes us tohu, okay? And uh, we were tohu. And with the weather vane was just, it's just going to flow whichever way the wind blows. Think about your life before Christ. You were just flowing whichever way the wind blows. You know, just, okay, whichever trend, whichever fad, whatever's in style, right? Okay, well, that's in style now. Okay, that's in style now, right? I did wore crazy looking clothes back in those days. You know, like tying my pants up. You remember this, Brother Kerrigan, you did it too. Yeah, they're telling you, oh, it's cool to, to tie your pants at the bottom and over the top of your... Your high tops and stuff looking looking crazy. Your feet were looking like big, like bozo and stuff. <laughs> no, no, I'm done with the weather vane, bro. <laughs> you see, my style doesn't change now. In Christ, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when you're in Christ, you don't you're not under the you're not in the weather vane anymore. You're not tohu anymore. You don't go with that. Not in the course of this world. Amen, bro. You know. You know. So that's what we were like tossed around. Like Scripture says, tossed around by every wind of doctrine. Right? That's what we were told. You were tossed around. <laughs> Believe this. <laughs> Check this out. <laughs> and just confusion. Right? And that's what Satan is. He's the god of confusion. That's all it does. He tears you up. And we were just meandering. You know? That's tohu. It's like, it's like a, a ship without a rudder. What's a ship without a rudder going to do? Yeah. With the winds, it's going to blow it around. And you know what's going to happen? It's probably going to sink out there. And that's what's going to happen if you just stay tohu. It's just going to sink. Okay? So that's tohu. And we, we were like hardened clay. Okay, that, that picture of that clay there. We were like hardened clay. Had no form. Right? Just an ugly lump. Because that's what sin does. It makes you, makes you ugly. Right? And so that's what we were, like hardened clay, without purpose. And before Christ got a hold of us. Right? Before the potter got a hold of us. And... So, and, and you think back, think back to Genesis 1. That's how God created the primordial earth. So primordial just means like creation in its earliest stage. Okay? That's not, I'm not talking about evolutionary theory of garbage right now. Primordial just, we can, I just want to use that term, primordial, because it just means like creation in its earliest form, its earliest stage, the beginnings. Primordial earth. Okay? And that's what we see. God created the heavens and the earth here. And... That's what he did right there. That, that was a picture of us, okay? That picture that God's creating right there is a picture of us before Christ. So when you read Genesis 1, 1 through 3 again, you can see yourself before Christ now. You can really see yourself before Christ. And uh, there's a picture of us. So we were tohu without form, but we were also bohu, right? We weren't just tohu, we were bohu. And bohu means void. And so its, it's emphasis is on emptiness. So we were not only just on the course of this world, but none of that course was filling us up, was it? It just, we were leaking, just, you know what I mean? We were leaking, just like, it's just coming out, it's, right? It, that's, that's what it was like, wasn't it? We were bohu, and that's what the primordial earth was like too. It was tohu, it was without form, but it was bohu, it was empty. Uh, in the primordial earth, it, it, there was no life there. There was no fullness. There's nothing there. It's empty, right? It's without form and void. And it had no life, no fruit trees. None of that had come, right? That's a picture of us. All of that comes later in, in the days of creation, right? And you can kind of think about it now like, whoa, the days of creation. Whoa, God's showing something radical here. You know, because it didn't stay that way. It didn't stay that way, did it? Just like those of you who have come to Christ, you didn't stay that way. 
you can look at your life now and you can think, wow, I'm not, I'm not like Genesis 1, 1 and 2 now. I'm not like that anymore. But you can remember when you were, right? So, but we were Bohu also, and that's what the, that's what the earth was like. And so, um, the Bible describes, well, also, we were, it doesn't say we were just Tohu, Wabohu, we were also in darkness. Remember? It says we're, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So it was without form, it was all empty, and the darkness was on it. Think back to your life before Christ now. Did you have a little darkness in your life? I had, I was in darkness. I was in total darkness. And the Bible describes darkness in many different ways. Um, I think of the darkness as the absence of Christ. You know what I mean? Darkness, you can just think of darkness as the absence of Christ in your life. You're in darkness because he's the light of our salvation, right? The Lord is my light. He who follows me, Jesus said, will not walk in darkness but have the light of life. So if, you're, if you don't have the light of life, you're in darkness. Just by the absence of Christ in your life, you're in darkness right now. Your life is without form, it's void, and there's darkness in your life, okay? Just by the absence of Christ. But also darkness is used uh, in the Bible to describe Satan's power, okay? Satan's power. The Bible says we were held captive by the devil to do his will, okay? And he's called the prince of darkness, okay? The prince of the power there, the rulers of darkness of this age, and the, and the evil entities that are at work, right? They're called the rulers of the darkness of this age in Ephesians 6. So um, that's, that's what our lives were like before Christ. Um, there, were, there were fallen entities that were influencing us. I, I can definitely think back to that. Dark entities that were influencing me. I was without form, void, and darkness was in my life. And so, and even if you think, well, no, I, don't, I, I, don't, I haven't had any encounters with evil spirits and everything. Um, well, you, one, of the, one of the enemy's tactics is like Keith Green's song. No one believes in me anymore. Right? You know, if he could just get you to believe that he doesn't exist, well, that's even greater darkness. You know? And uh, so that's, that's dark. That's still a tactic of the enemy. We're not to be ignorant of his schemes. Um, so... Let's turn back to 2 Corinthians 4, related to this darkness, okay? So we already read, we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, how Paul is pointing back to Genesis, right, as a picture of our salvation, about how the light shined on the primordial earth, right? It was without form, void, darkness, it shined. And he says, the one who did that has shined in our hearts to bring us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, right? So, picture there, we've already seen that, that the light came. Um, but just a few verses before that, okay? A few verses before that, in uh, what we see is that the Lord is revealing something from Genesis 1, 1 through 3 as a picture of, of salvation here. Just a little bit before Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Um, he speaks of something else. So, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, just a couple verses before. You see how Paul's going to talk about this darkness. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. If your mind is blinded, that means you're in darkness, right? If you're blind, are you in darkness? You're in darkness. Because you, you, you have to have light in order to see, right? So if you're, 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 you're blinded, then it means you're in darkness, you have no light, and uh, Satan was, was blinding them. So it says, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So Paul, even before he talks about, even before he points back to Genesis, he's showing that you were in darkness, right? You were in darkness, just like the primordial earth was in darkness. Right here, we were in darkness, the God of this age had blinded us, and we were in darkness, so that the light wouldn't shine on us, okay? The enemy doesn't want the Lord to be able to say, let there be light in your life, right? The enemy doesn't want that. He wants you to stay blinded and stay in darkness. And so the, the light doesn't come. He wants you to stay in that without form and void and in darkness state, the primordial, primordial earth state. He wants you to stay in that state. That's how he wants you to stay. Okay? He wants you to stay that way. But the enemy wants to do that, but the Lord wants to do that complete work that you see in the rest of the days of creation in your life. That's what he wants to do. Okay? And what, what happened after each day? God saw it was good. 
So the Lord has a good work to do in your life, right? But you don't, you, you don't see that right there in verses 1 and 2. He didn't say, oh, this is good. Without form, void, darkness, very good. Uh-uh. It's not until after the light comes. Amen? Then it's very good. And I see very good work of God in people here. That's what I see in my brothers and sisters. Very good work of God in your life. And so I just wanted you to be encouraged and continue to walk in those good works that the Lord has prepared for you to walk in, just like in, Gen in Genesis 1, you know, the days of creation. So that, that shows Paul was obviously, he's in, in 2 Corinthians there, he has this Genesis chapter 1 motif in his mind. He has this, these thoughts in his mind. So he's painting a picture. He's pointing back to Genesis with the salvation experience, okay? So, so after Paul connected verse 6, uh, we see these other verses in 3 and 4 are very clear, referring to our dark, how we were in darkness. All right? And uh, so before uh, the light came, we were in darkness. And then after the light came, he started to recreate us, didn't he? Started to recreate us. So you see in Genesis 1 how there was creation there, and it was in that state. And the light comes, and then he starts to, he starts to recreate. So he already created it, it's there, but he's going to start to recreate it, okay, into something. And that's what the Lord wants to do in each of our lives. Amen? He wants to do that. And uh, so we're not to be, stay in darkness. The enemy wants to keep us in darkness so that we don't become new creations in Christ. Okay? But 2 Corinthians also, if you, you, some of you guys can probably think of another verse. The Lord once he starts recreating, right, um, makes us into new creations, right? So you see we're in darkness, you see the light shines, and then can anyone think of a verse that comes next that Paul is going to bring out? 2 Corinthians 5.17, right? So that's a very important verse. And it's no, it's no coincidence that Paul is, he's showing this picture. We're in darkness, the light shines. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So can you see how the Apostle Paul is, he's laying, there's actually a whole lot more, but he's laying out this creation picture of redemption. You see it? He's pointing back to Genesis. We were in darkness. The light shines. And then, but in Christ, you're new creations. And that's what you see in Genesis beginning at verse 3. The light shines, and then what happens? New creation starts to flow, right? And the rest of the days of creation, new creation. And that is a picture of us. That's a picture of us. So that, just as the days of creation flowed and God saw that it was good, he did a good work, we need to offer the Lord each day of our life. Amen? And let him do a good work in us each day. You know, knowing that our life is a picture, this, this creation is a picture of our life in Christ. You see what I'm saying? And... Paul's not doing this by accident. New creations in Christ, right? He's pointing back to Genesis and that creation work. And that's an awesome work. And you see that took a lot of power. I mean, it was pretty awesome work they did in the beginning. You know what I mean? He wants to do that awesome work in your life, that, that power of God. That's a, the gospel is the power of God, right? For salvation to everyone who believes. So the Lord's doing that beautiful work in Christ. Uh, we're no longer tohu wabohu and in darkness, just like the earth was. Um, that's a beautiful picture. And so hopefully that was a blessing to you. Now, I just wanted to kind of conclude with this. Um, we're going to look more at, these, at, at this subject. But the beginning of typology is in the beginning. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. Okay? But I want to fast forward and just encourage on, on Father's Day. Okay? The, that's the beginning of the typological pictures in God's Word. Is right there. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. But the end, okay, the end, the greatest picture of all, the greatest typological picture of all is you, okay? We see what God's doing there to, to redeem you and make you into a new creation, but the greatest type, type is you. So God wants each of you in Christ to be a type of the anti tupon who is Jesus, okay? So, the, so the, the end goal of all typology in God's word is to make you a type of Jesus, the antitype. Okay? He's, right? That's what he wants you to actually become. And so 
Uh, he's seeking to make us into the image of his son. That's, that's the picture. He wants you to be the picture of Christ. Okay? The Bible's full of pictures to point us to Christ, but the end goal is that you become like Christ. You become the greatest picture of all. Amen? And so Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus um, about this, Ephesians 4, 11. It says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature or the image, the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that's God's intention, is that you would become the type of Christ. Amen? The picture of Jesus Christ. And I know a lot of times, I know you could think, what, what, is, what is God doing in your life? You know, you might be going through something that's very difficult. You might go, be going through something that's very painful. And you might be thinking like, like, Lord, what are you doing? You know, what are you, what are you doing? Why are you allowing this to happen? And the Lord's allowing these things to happen. It's kind of like but going, going back to that clay, right? You know, we are the clay. He's the potter. And, the, you know, the, they have a wheel. The potters have a wheel. And it spins on the wheel. It goes spinning. And that's kind of like God allowing the, the things to, circumstances and things to come into your life. And, and there's pressure that he puts, right? And it spins on the wheel. And that's kind of the circumstances and the, and the trials and the temptations and the different things that God allows into your life in order to form you and make you a type of him, okay? So that's what the potter does. So it's like, I know sometimes it, it, feels, it feels painful to go through certain things with the Lord, but you have to know that his goal is to make you into the image of his son, okay? And on Father's Day, I was just thinking, there's nothing that can honor our Father more than us yielding to Him and saying, I want to be made into the image of your Son. There's nothing that honors our Father more than that. Okay? But it might, it might mean you're going to you know, go through some pain on the wheel. Alright? But the end goal is to make you like Him. And just think about this. Think about Jesus. Everything in him is perfect and beautiful and, and love and, right? Everything. Can you find anything wrong in Jesus? Is there anything that you don't want to be like him in? Do you want to be like him? Amen. That's the, that's the goal of, of our Father, okay? To make us a type of Jesus, our anti tupon okay? Amen. And so when you, when you come up to things you don't understand... Like we all have things we come up to that we don't understand. Um, just know that, that it's part of this process. It's part of this process of making us like him. That's what it is. Just know that. That's God's intention. Because we're all going to come up to things that we don't understand. But we need to understand that. That's what we need to understand. When you don't understand something, you need to understand that that's what God's doing. That's what he's doing. Amen? And we can trust him. Can we trust him? Right? Can we trust him? The, the one who created the, the picture of our redemption in the very first three verses? Does that mean he's thinking about us? That, that he loves us? That he, that he cares about us? He's going to put us right there in the first three verses? He, he, his mind is for us, right? You know, David says, if I could count all your thoughts toward me, they'd be more than the grains of sand on the earth. You know, that he cares for us like that. And, and he's, he's committed. He's committed. He's committed to making us like him. He's committed. He is fully committed. He fully committed when he came to earth. Fully committed when he went to that cross. He was fully committed, holding nothing back. Amen? And he always did those things that pleased the Father. And so God is working. He's working to make you like his son. He's molding, shaping, and forming you. And uh, last verse, Romans 8, 28, 29. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. See, we're not like the weather vane. We're not purposeless anymore. We've been called to the purpose of Christ now, right? And so now we have purpose, right? We're not tohu wabohu anymore. We're not in darkness anymore. Amen? We're called according to his purpose. We love God. We see his love all the way in the beginning. This good work that he wants to do. He's good. We sang it today. He's a good, good father. Right? He's good. Why not be good to him? Why not be good to him? Amen? Why not be good to him? You know, if somebody does good to me, 
I don't automatically think of punching him in the face or something. Do you? Someone does good to you? Do you automatically think of doing something evil to them? No. Do, do, do you kind of want to like do something good for them? <laughs> no one has been good like our good, good father. You know what I mean? So let's do good to him. You know, and the thing you could do is just say, Lord, I, I, I want you to do that good work in me. Just like you did in creation. I, I want to be your creation. I, I, I want to let you do it. And uh, he works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to what? Here's the predestined. He predestined us to something. To be conformed to the image of his son. That was part of the plan of redemption all the way before creation. Okay? He predestined that those who are going to be his children, he predestined that we would be conformed to the image of his son. But we have a part in that. And Jeremiah, it says, he told Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house and look at the potter working on the pottery. And, he, and he's working the pottery. He's talking about Israel. And he says, the, potter, the, pot, the pottery became marred in the potter's hands. You know what I mean? It like cracked. It broke. It's like, it didn't yield. Right? And so then he's got to smash it and start over and look that, do that primordial. It's, it's a blessing that God will do that. Put us back on the wheel, though. You know? Like that primordial earth. He'll do that. He'll start that work over again in your life. If you've done that, he'll start it over. But he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the father speaking there. So the father wants to make us like his son. I mean, they used to be commercials, remember? Oh, you remember this, bro. Like Mike, if I could be like Mike. You want to be like Michael Jordan, you want to be like Jesus. I mean, here's your choice. If you, now, now, what if you could be like Michael Jordan? Well, I mean, he can't play basketball anymore. Not that well. He still beat, probably beat all of us, but he can't play like he did before. So, I mean, which Mike, which Mike do you want to be like? Do you want to be like Mike, the, the one who's in the front office of Charlotte Hornets or whatever, I think, now? Or do you want to be like Mike in the Chicago Bulls? But how long could you be like Mike? How many years? Just think about it. Just put, it in the, put it in the scales, your life. It's in the balance. You're going to live for eternity, or are you just going to live for the temporary things of this life? You know? The Lord's saying, I want to make you like my son. That just brings so much comfort to me. Sometimes I'm going through so many hard, difficult things. It's like warfare, all the things, you know, all the things we go through. Like, I just know that you can make me more like your son. And I just know he had such victory. Did Jesus have such great, wonderful victory and peace? And, it? like, and it just, that just gives me hope that God's not done with me. I can still become more like him. And I can know more freedom. I can know more freedom. I can know more peace. I can know more joy. I can have more of him. Amen? And so that's God's intention. That's what he wants to do. And so do you believe that the Father can make you more like his son? Do you believe that? Amen? If you believe, raise up your hand. Who believes it? Amen, 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 amen. All right, amen.